Hey guys, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about this series, but I'm also excited about that opportunity. I had Jason come because there are a couple of advantages for the people here at Vertical Church, but when I was having dinner with them in New York City in July, and they told me the condition of the orphanage. See, I took a group of people there last uh, November. This time last year, we were in the nation of Miramar, okay? And some of those people here can attest to that they interacted, they worked at that orphanage, they worked with that church, they worked with some of the outreach programs that were there. Here's the advantage, okay? Sponsoring a child is one that you would actually have the opportunity to go see because we're about to do our next mission trip to Miramar, and it's a place that we're going to continually go. We built a partnership through World Compassion and what God is doing on the ground. I don't have time to tell you, but that some 19 years ago, when God revealed to me, watching a movie with my then, actually it's 21 years ago, my goodness, okay, with my then fiance, okay, who became my wife, watching a movie, God broke my heart for the nation of Burma. And God said to me, one day you will go there. One day you will have an impact. I had no idea what the future held for Vertical Church. And when I was there in 2013 and saw the winds of change and what God was doing, guys, this is one of those areas, as Jason said to you, is 1.6 million orphans. Imagine if the church really became the church and arose and shone. You can change the trajectory of a whole nation in one generation if compassion leads our heart. And so when we were meeting and we had dinner, I said, hey, how's the, how's the orphanage going? This, the 27 kids that were presently in the program, they said, we don't have full sponsorship from all yet. I said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You come to Vertical Church. Allow the people of Vertical Church to get behind that because I believe not only will all of those sponsorships be filled, but God will begin to move the funding forward. I believe in you guys. I believe in the opportunities that God provides it. You know, our family, we've been sponsoring Solly Bai for a number of years. My son, Austin, got to play with Solly Bai last year. They're exact same age. Some of the things, one of the reasons why I selected him to, for our sponsorship that way. And so they became friends. They both love soccer, okay? It was fascinating. And so it's just an opportunity, something you can pray about. Hey, guys, before I get into the message, one other quick thing. I wanted to read you a scripture because you all know events transpired in the course of our nation this last week. And, of course, across our nation, people are on two sides of it because if you haven't recognized something, we have a polarized nation. I have prayed more for our nation over this last year than I ever have. And here's my point. I trust God. I hope you will as well. Because some people are excited and some people are distressed at the outcome of this election. But I wanted to read you a scripture to put it into into biblical perspective for you. This comes out of the book of Daniel. And it's a lesson that God taught to a heathen king, but I believe it's one that we all can take some wisdom from because the principle is true. And you and I, I am praying just as much now for our nation because I do not trust a party or a person to change the trajectory or to save our nation. The word says, if my people would humble themselves and pray, those that are called by my name, And would seek my face. And listen, turn from their wicked ways. If you and I become divisive, if you and I become polarized to this, we will fall into the prey and the trap of the enemy. Will we be the people of God? If my people turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and what? Heal their land. That's what we need, guys. The intervention of God. And here's what God told Nebuchadnezzar. And I thought this to be true. He said this. And you will be driven away from the people. Because God was telling him, listen. Nebuchadnezzar, you thought you've been in charge. You thought you've been in power. You thought you built Babylon. Let me help you understand something that you presently do not understand. And he said this. You will be driven away from the people. And you will live as wild animals. And will eat grass like the ox, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by until you acknowledge. And here's the point. It'll drive people crazy until they acknowledge this. Okay, I pray none of you are in that way. But listen, till you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. In 2008, God put Barack Obama in charge of this nation. That was the sovereign hand of God. 2012, God 
brought Barack Obama back into that role of leading this land. Now in this last election, God has sought fit to put Donald J. Trump in charge of it. Whether you or I ever understand the mind of the Almighty, you and I have the responsibility to pray for our nation, trust God, and recognize that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and he gives them to whosoever he will. Amen. I hope you would join me and continue to pray for our nation. But hey, let's get into it because I'm excited about this series. Actually, I think it's just a good time. Let's pray for a moment, okay? Heavenly Father, we do submit and yield our hearts wholly, totally, and truly to you because you are the most high God and you are sovereign over our lives and over the lives of all mankind. Whether we submit, whether we walk with you is our choice. But Almighty God, you're large and in charge. And today, we ask you to write your message on the very tables of our heart that we may gain the wisdom and understanding of your word and walk in it. Today, we trust in the Holy Spirit who is with us today to guide and to lead us, to teach us things that we need to understand and to know so that we can succeed and prosper in all good things, so that we can honor your will and do your purposes while we are on this earth. So we commit and submit ourselves to you today. Direct us and lead us in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement with that say amen. Well, hey, we began a series last week called The Game of Life. It's the only game that's really worth winning. It's the one that matters most. And so that's why I want you to, because have you ever played The Game of Life? You ever had it? Where's my board game? Oh, didn't hear me. Listen. Do you guys, you remember when you played a game? One of the things that's important, okay, because the game of life, I thought about it because it's a simulation of life. There are decisions in life. But here's a fascinating reality to that. You can learn something about life even through a board game. Because one of the most important, the number one rule of any board game is that when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. That's the number one rule. And so it is in the game of life. That when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. And what does that mean? Whether you and I realize it or not, life is a gift from God. We are not owners. We are stewards over the things that he provides. And what does stewardship mean? Stewardship means that it's temporary and we are accountable. And so what it is is I want all of us to be winners because how do you win? You have to first, we looked at this last week, we realized that people get busy playing the game and they don't even know the objective of the game. And I don't want anybody to, to, to uh, uh, have a total loss. If I've gone through life and no matter what, even if I thought I was the master of the board, when the game is over, what do I have to show? And the objective of the game of life is simple. Here it is. We talked about it last week. In fact, if you miss any of the messages here, you can always catch them online at any time, anywhere, and catch up on it. But here's what we learned last week. The objective of the game is to be rich towards God. And so that's the heartbeat behind this series because I want all of us to be winners. Because winning, the world system says winning is how much you have when you die. But that's foolish because no matter how much you have when you die, guess what? You ain't taking any of it with you. It's all going to someone else. But there are things you can do at the end of the game. When you are rich towards God, we can be at the end winners. And so that's the idea. So today, where we're going to pick up on this idea is if you want to win, you got to play by the rules. Right? Do you ever have kids? Do you ever have kids? I mean, everybody tries to cheat at times. You know, in Monopoly, my friends used to try to slip money under the board. Okay? But guess what? With God, you can't cheat. He knows it all, right? So you got to play by the rules. If you want to win, you got to play by the rules. And how do you know what the rules are? Well, don't you consult the instructions? How do you even know how to play the game? God's given us the instructions. It's called the Bible. It's called his word. And even more importantly than that, he wrote them on the tables of our heart. And God has given us. So today we're going to look at... One of the most, and I believe the chief rule of all that you and I need to know. So if you're following me, if you're taking notes, look at this. That's important that we recognize this, that the earth runs by the law of the harvest. The earth runs 
by the law of the harvest. In Genesis 8, it said these words. God spoke through Noah, and he said this. As long as the earth remains. In other words, you can't change this. As long as the earth is here, this is the way God has functioned. This is the way God's designed it. You can't change it. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, okay, summer and winter, day and night. Now, most of those we have no question about, right? Now, you may be a person who loves summer, but guess what? We're coming into winter, and there's nothing you can do about it unless be a snowbird and go live somewhere warm in the winter, okay? All right? There's going to be cold and heat. There's going to be night and day. There's going to be uh, uh, um, summer and winter. Well, we don't ever question those things, do we? We never wonder at night when we go to bed, oh, is morning going to come? Do you think there's going to be another day? Do you sit around worrying about those things? No, we don't question any of those realities. And it is important that we understand the law of planting and harvest because it is entirely how the way the world exists. It's how everything in the world runs. In fact, it was the theme of Jesus' chief parable of all. He said the sower sows the word. God's kingdom runs by this principle. In fact, in the book of Galatians, it tells us this, do not be deceived, okay? God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, the same shall he reap. Whether he sows to the flesh, he will of the flesh reap corruption. Whether he sows to the spirit, he will of the spirit reap life everlasting. The entire world, everything we encounter, runs by the law of the harvest. Think about it for a moment. If you sow into your studies, you reap good grades. If you sow your education, you reap a career. If you, people wonder and say, you know what, I want a great relationship. I want a great marriage. My question is this, what are you sowing? Because people act sometimes like, like, they're, like they're ignorant of this. Listen, whatever you sow, you reap. In other words, you have to give yourself to it. Investing produces increase. It works in every facet of life. If you want good health, you need to sow into your health. Is that not correct? What you eat, what you do, exercise around. We know that in every other facet of life. And here it is important to understand, if the world that God created operates this way, it behooves us to gain the wisdom and the understanding of how to harness those realities to work for us, not against us. The more wisdom we gain, in fact, gravity is a law, correct? But when people encountered the understanding of the law of thrust and the law of lift, we were able to supersede the law of gravity, correct? That's why we can fly planes. It's not a mystery, right? It's because they're gained understanding of those things. And yes, listen to me, there is a law of depravity. On the earth right now, because sin came into the earth, there is the law of decay. If you don't believe in that, all you have to do is leave something metal out over the winter and see what it looks like come spring. Okay? It'll be covered with rust, right? Because everything in the earth is breaking down. But you and I, God's given us the ability to know how to supersede some of these things through the wisdom and plan and purpose of God. And that is why you and I, because it is important in understanding this, that the law of sowing is about trusting. Here, here is the law of harvest, okay? What I plant today will what? Produce when? Tomorrow? No, we know this about the law of harvest in this. Any farmer recognizes what I plant today, there's a process that's entailed. And I will reap later and greater. But it takes what? Trust. It takes time, yes. But it takes trust. Trusting that this process, every farmer understands it. And here's another part of the law of the harvest. That what I plant necessarily doesn't look exactly like what I reap. When I plant a seed, a seed can be deceptive. 
because you don't know the potential that's in that seed. But God has already worked within it. That in every seed is the ability to produce something that God designed it to produce. We know that in every area of agriculture because when you plant a seed, it doesn't look like a tomato when it goes into the ground if it's a tomato seed, right? But we know what will come out of it. And we also know that when it grows, it produces something greater than what you planted. But what is it? That inhibits people because we also know in the process, when you understand the law of the harvest, that there's a time scale, there's a trust factor, and there's a care reality. In other words, you can't go back and dig it up. you got to let it produce. That's where trusting God comes into play. Okay? And if we're going to be rich toward God, this is where we learn to trust that God is is large and in charge. That God works according to his principles. Because why? What is it that keeps people from sowing? Somebody said it. Fear. Fear. Because what happens is this. Even a farmer, if you look at what you have and say, oh my God, if I take a part of that and sow it, I may not have that. But that would be foolish, right? Because any farmer would know, I won't have a harvest if I don't take this, right? How do I get ahead? I'm going to have to take a portion of this and sow it so that it produces as God designed it to produce. But fear has this ability to captivate our mind and and control our actions to the point where we say, no, I can't. I can't do without. But listen, what God teaches us is this. When you know the laws of God, when you trust God, when you believe that you're truly not an owner, that God is large and in charge, when you trust God, you believe that investing is the only rational thing to do and fear is irrational. Fear actually inhibits. Fear can rob me of the opportunities to see what God and God alone can do. And so God wants us to be wise to this end. God wants us to have understanding of this end. Because to move on with God, it is for us to recognize that God has given us the capacity through that. When we, because how do you overcome fear? How do you overcome fear? Faith. Oh, faith. And I always say this, the easiest way to, to you, have to, you have to fight fear with fear. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but listen, when you trust God more than any other thing, when you fear God, fearing God is not being afraid of God. Fearing God means honor and respecting God to the point of submission. In other words, I trust God, therefore I will do, because I believe, because you overcome fear through faith, which means I believe God is who he said he is and that he will do what he said he will do. So the only way to truly control fear is to face your fears with faith in Almighty God. To know what God said and to trust that because God said it, it's so. I believe it and trust that God is capable of doing everything he said he would do. So if you're taking notes, listen. You and I need to realize this. That the law of the harvest applies to our finances. The law of the harvest applies to our finances. I discovered this some 30 some odd years ago when I first started to walk with Christ. And just as a 20 year old college student, I recognized something, okay? I didn't have, I went to college, you know, I moved out of my home when I was 17. My dad had a third grade education, was a truck driver, okay? I went to college on my own. My father didn't offer to help in the least. I tried to get by on my soccer, but there wasn't a lot of scholarship money in America for soccer in the time frame when I went to go play. So I worked at jobs and went with you, tried to go to college and try to get ahead on this end. So I didn't have a lot. But when I got saved, okay, when I found Christ, I began to discover the laws of God. I began to discover the way God operates. And I have found this to be true. Through the entirety of my life, God has taken care of me. Through every difficulty I have faced, that I have allowed the principles of what I believe about God to guide and direct my life. So when people try to question whether or not it works, I can tell them without a doubt, I have seen God over the years of my life come through in ways I never anticipated. When God opened up the door for me to go into business for myself, 
all that I achieved, all I came back and recognized, it wasn't because I was so smart or I had it together. It was simply this. Trusting God pays dividends in life. God is faithful. He will do what he said he will do, but it will always cause you to have to step out into uncomfortable materials to trust him when you are challenged to trust him. And so the law of the harvest applies to our finances. Look with me if you have 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you have a Bible today, turn there to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember the instructions. What are the instructions? you got a book full of them. That's why I encourage you. You need to be Bible readers, but more than Bible readers, Bible believers. That what you hold in your hand, these ancient documents that someone put together, some, you know, we didn't have what we call a Bible to some three, almost 250 years after the resurrection of Jesus, okay? What we call the, the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament together, those, those scriptures were put together by followers of Jesus. But listen to me. What they believed about, the, about these texts were this, that they were not the words of man, but in truth, the word of God. And they would work effectively, powerfully in those that believe it. And that's why it was precious to have. That's why it was an honor to hold, to be able to read and know and understand and to live by the instructions that God has clearly provided for us. So 2 Corinthians Chapter 9 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul, writing to these once pagan followers, the city of Corinth was in ancient Greece. It was kind of like the, the, the Las Vegas of ancient Greece, okay? What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. They were a very carnal bunch. And when you read the New Testament letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, you kind of realize, wow, I can feel better about myself reading about these folks because they're followers of Jesus and they got all these problems. There's hope for me. And Paul is giving instructions to them and gives them this understanding about how the law of the harvest applies to the finance because he says this. Now notice, let's read this together. Remember this. Why did he say that? Because truthfully, this is something that's easy to forget. He said, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now listen, why would someone sow sparingly? The answer to that is simple. Fear. Fear. I can't let go of anything. So he says, he who sows sparingly, the law of the harvest works. They will reap sparingly. And what would cause someone to sow generously? Faith. Trust. That I believe. Yeah. God will come through because he said it. And I believe it. And I trust. So he says, and he was so. And what's fascinating to me about this is that God has left to every one of us the ability to control our own, our own destiny in the area of finance. That's a fascinating thought. Because the more we learn to trust God, now, I don't mean foolishness. Because there's a lot of people that hear something and in their mind they come up with a get rich quick scheme and they try to pull that one on God. No, faith is a matter of the heart. And so it is, trust is all about do I believe, do I trust in Almighty God? And he says here, when you learn to trust God, God gives you the ability to move from faith to faith, to grow in your faith, to see the faithfulness of God generation after generation, year after year. God continues because what? The law of the harvest. See, well, some people, in their desperation, they hear about something like giving, and they have an immediate need. They have a miracle they need on their hands. And so they want to give a gift because they want something to happen tomorrow. That's not the law of seed time and harvest. Does God do miracles? Yes, but this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living your life by the principles of God. Believing and understanding that it is a life commitment to recognize that what I sow today will be reaped in the future. Everything has a cycle. Everything has a gestation period. Okay? Everything has that end. And the more we know and understand, our trust in God remains intact, that when we faithfully, listen, follow God. Not our own desires. When we faithfully follow God, God knows what's coming in our lives and gives us the ability to provide for it long before it ever arrives. You see, God's best for you is not to provide a financial miracle. 
God's best for you is to understand the law of the harvest that you always, having every need met, have more than enough so that you can help the other people who don't have their needs met meet the needs of others. That's God's best. That's the way the kingdom of God works. But then he goes on to say in verse 7, each of you should give what you have, this is, this is so fast, what you have decided in your what? Your heart. That's where faith resides. That's where we need to be honest with God and ourselves. Where is my heart in this matter? Because God says this, each of you, what you determine to give should be a decision of your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. In other words, it should be never external pressures that make us give. But what? For God loves a cheerful giver. We should be able to approach the things because when you trust in God, yeah, it may confront your fears. Yeah, it may cause you at times to say, you know what? Wow, okay. But trusting God, there's a freedom. There's a liberation in all that. That's what God wants. So he says each of you should give because it's a purpose. It's a matter of the heart. In other words, it shouldn't be because of what someone else told you to do. It should only be because you know what God's word has instructed you to do. And that's why we go from faith to faith. Because as the more we learn to trust God, the more our faith grows. The more we are free to do what God says to do. Because you would never doubt that God's going to come through for you. And then verse 8. Because here's, I, I, I love this scripture. This is the promise God associated to it. I love this. This is one of the ones, I memorized this a long time ago. Listen. I trust God because he said this, and God is what? Able. See, that's what you have to ask the question. Do you believe God is able? See, we have so many parameters, so many compartments, so many ways of limiting what we believe God's able to do. Can God move in your business? I don't know about that. Can God move on the heart of your boss? I don't know about that. Can God take care of your need? He don't know my situation. Okay. Wow, maybe I can believe, okay, that I can trust that when I die in the sweet by and by, God can take care of me. But today, you mean in the middle of earth's circumstances? You don't know my case, Pastor Ken. No, I don't. But I know God. And here's what I can tell you of assurance. God is able. But it's not important what I believe. You have to recognize faith is an individual thing. As much as I believe for you, and I pray for all of you guys daily. My prayer, though, is that you learn to trust God more and more. Because God is able. That's why it's always a matter of the heart. He says this, and God is able to do what? To bless you abundantly. Notice, not just enough to get by. God is able to bless you abundantly. Why? Because here's the thing that people haven't understood. Prosperity has a purpose. People got caught up in it. I got, you know, I, I watch people go through the 80s, 90s and, and misunderstand this message entirely and make a mess out of their lives and bring disgrace to the kingdom of God. But it doesn't make the principles of the word of God any less true. God is able to bless you abundantly. Why? So that in all, I love this. That's so cool. All things and at all times. Don't you love the word all? Last time I looked in the dictionary, all meant everything. It meant all. It means nothing left out. All things, at all times, having all that you want, need. Now, he didn't say necessarily all that you want, right? That's where some people struggle, okay? There's a difference between your needs and your wants. And I know that our biggest problem in America is we've made our wants our needs, but that's not for discussion today. Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. In other words, you know what God's saying in through this promise? Here's the promise of his word. That I'm able to take care of you so well that you will have more than you need so you can share with others who are in need because that's how my kingdom operates. How does God meet the needs that are in the earth today. It is important that we, the people of God, begin to understand. If we are in truth the body of Jesus, how do we expect Jesus to meet needs? Through the body of Christ. 
Because that's why verse 9, Paul quotes to them Psalm 112. It's one of my favorite psalms of the Old Testament. It's a fascinating one. And it's full of promises of a person who lives with full trust in God. But he pulls his, Paul pulls this part out of Psalm 112. And he says, as it is written, they have freely, freely scattered their gifts to who? To the poor. And their what? Their righteousness endures forever. So God says that part of our right standing, part of our ways that we express God to the world that we live in is what we do with what we have. That's how we make Jesus famous. And those are deeds, my friends, that last more than for tomorrow or for next year. They last for eternity. And so, if you're taking notes with me, listen. It's important to see this. Oh, actually, it says faith in God is built as we learn to what? Trust in the law of the harvest. Trust. In the law of the harvest. Guys, go back to verse 10. I, I, I skipped it, but I need to, I need to say it again. Because look at we need to recognize this. Now, he who supplies what? Seed. Who gives the seed? God. To the sower. And who supplies bread for food? Will also supply and increase the store of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. This is God's plan. This is what God intended. You see, but you and I have to begin to make assessments. Who gives you the seed you have? And who's the one who supplies your needs? If you're trusting in yourself, well, then you'll be limited in your ability to achieve. God will do everything he can to help you, but listen to me. Until you begin to trust God, you will never begin to understand what God is capable of doing in your life. And that's why I want you all to be winners. So go back again. Here's the fill-in. That... Faith in God is built as we learn to trust in the law of the harvest. In other words, guys, the more we trust God, the more we operate according to the law of the harvest. That's why it's a matter of the heart. That's why it's a matter of trust. That's why it's an opportunity for you and I to recognize that we begin somewhere. And the more we show God is faithful, the more it should increase and stretch us. But there is a reason why do we give? To make us feel good? To make us feel like, hey, I did a great thing? No, there's a bigger reason than that. There's a bigger reason than that. You see, when you learn to trust the law of the harvest, you recognize something. That God is doing something in you. God is helping you in the area where all of us struggle most. It's with our stuff. Can we trust God at that level? God says, I'm trustworthy, but walk with me. Learn to understand this principle. Use it as the tin, because I will increase your righteousness as you work together with me. Because look at this next fill in, and Felicity, he's taking notes with me. Financial giving aligns our life with God's agenda. Financial giving aligns our life with God's agenda. Why? Because, again, Psalm 112 quoted it. Who did he freely scatter? His gifts to people who were without. And so how was God? We ask the question, how is God meeting the need? How is God answering the need of orphans in Burma? Because when people who have more than they need to take care of their situation share a part of what they have, they begin to make the plan of God a reality, not just in their life, but to others. It begins the answer of Christ to all the different facets of where there are needs around it in our world, that when our giving begins to be in that purpose, that God, I am partnering together with you. I see it. I get it. You're giving me the chance to plan because you want to increase me so that I can always be available to do any good work because I've got more than enough. My needs are met. And Lord, this is exciting. It's the most rewarding. It's the most fascinating. It provides, listen to me, guys. It provides something not just for now, but it actually is the stuff that lasts for eternity. You see, people here at VC, people here at Vertical Church get this. Because you know why? How were 254 people able to make first-time decisions for Christ last year here at Vertical Church? Why were over 
400 kids able to be ministered to through VBS this last summer. And with that, 120-something kids give their lives to Christ for the first time. How is any of that capable? How is over 1,000 families going to be fed during this Thanksgiving season? Because people here at VC understand this reality that when my financial giving it aligns me with the agenda of God that I make what God is doing on the earth possible. That's partnership. And when we work together, there is no limit to what we can achieve because God says, can you trust me? Can you believe? Can you allow me? Because remember, you have actually borrowed merchandise because when the game is over, let me remind you again, it all goes back in the box. It's all mine. I'm giving you a chance to play the game. I'm giving you a chance to learn the life that's really life. I'm giving you a chance to live like I live, to be able to experience life like I experience it, because you get the joy of what you see happen today and Guess what? For eternity, you sponsor one of those orphans, whether or not you ever traveled to Burma, I guarantee you in heaven, there's going to be a Burmese kid come up to you that will know your name and say thank you because you allowed generosity to move your heart beyond your comfort zone. And you, I'm here today telling this story because of what you obeyed God in. There is nothing. That's what it means, guys, to be rich toward God. You and I get to empower the plan of God. And here's the last reality if you're taking notes. Faithfulness is rewarded. God said, when you're faithful, I will reward you. Can I trust you? Here's the biggest thing from God. God is never limited in his ability to provide. The issue always is, can I trust you with it? If I give it to you, will you just use it all for you? Or will you share? Isn't that what we want our kids to know? Any good parent, you tell your kids, listen, share, right? Well, God is the father. And he says, listen, if I can trust you, faithfulness is rewarded. He said, well, God, just let me, let me win the lottery. And I will, listen to me. All that's uncertainty. Listen, God is bigger than the lottery. Question is this. Why would you think you would be faithful with a lot if you can't even manage the little that you have? God works through faithfulness because trust starts there. And so let's look at God's instructions for sowing. God's instructions for sowing are simple. Number one, make it a priority. Why? Why? Because you know as well as I do, things that are a priority actually get done in your life. What we often have to do is, listen, a lot of times we have intentions. And I don't know about you, but I can tell off on me. There's a lot of things I intend to do, and those are my biggest regrets. Because a lot of those I don't get to. I'm not as faithful with my exercise. I'm not as faithful with drinking my water as I ought to be. There's a lot of things I intend to do. Okay? But you know what gets done in my house? What's a priority? You know as well as I do, whatever becomes a PR. Because listen, there's two types of people who are givers. Listen to me. There are people who give leftovers. What does that mean? And that's not derogatory. Listen, you pay all that you need to pay. You got to take care of all your other deals. And guess what? Whatever's left, okay, God, I hear I bring you because you know I have all these needs. God says, listen, can you invite me into your circumstances and watch what only I can do? Will you only do it when you can figure it out intellectually? Or will you trust me? beyond your intellect. Will you believe that I am who I say I am? That I will do, watch what only I can do on your behalf. That's the question that we are all confronted with. So listen to me. God prays to make it a priority. Listen, have you ever had guests come over your house? Anybody ever had a guest come over your house? What do you serve guests? Well, if you come to the Vance house, my wife, would have a fit if I invited people over and say, yeah, babe, we got leftovers in the fridge. We'll just throw all that together. We'll make a shepherd pie. They'll, come on. It's just a matter of having them over. OMG, are you kidding me? I would have a list going to stop and shop and everyone, me and my kids, would have our hands slapped if we tried to eat any of it before our guests came. 
Because why? Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Because don't you honor your guests? And what does that mean? You give them what comes first. God gave us the principle of tithing. People have misunderstood this for years. You know what the principle of tithing taught? That God comes first. God comes first. Can I trust? If I put, but you see, when you put God first, God says, no one who honors me, I will not honor. And I can tell you that for a, fa- for a truth. I've watched it all my life. Okay? But priority means we honor God. We give him first priority because we trust. See, the opportunity to give financially is an opportunity to invite God into the middle of your circumstance. People say, well, you don't know what's going on right now, Pastor Ken. Once I get this straightened out, I'm like, well, would you rather try to do that on your own? Or would you like God's help? Well, yeah, I want God's help. Well, trust him. I say, well, that's heartless. That's cold. How could you say that? Because he's the only one that's trustworthy. I just believe God's bigger. I've seen him come through again and again and again. So all I can say is determine in your heart where you can start. Because here's my next principle. Make it a priority too. Determine a percentage. Why percentage? Why does the Bible teach priority percentage giving? Why? Because percentage objectifies something that can be far too subjective to us. What do I mean by that? Subjective means it's according to your feelings. Well, yeah, I'm generous. Okay, and what do you measure that by? Well, you know, I felt like this came, you know, this happened, and I gave. and I was like, Oh, that's cool. I, I'm excited by that. But, see, objectifying something means you become intentional upon it. And guess what? It doesn't ever move by your feelings. Because faith is not feelings. Faith is trust no matter what the circumstances are going on around you. I believe in God because God is bigger than my circumstances. Therefore, I must, listen, determine a percentage. You start somewhere. You start wherever your heart can say, okay, I can trust you in that. Because here it is. Percentage means that as God increases you, you increase. It doesn't stay the same. So you make it a priority. You determine a percentage. I began, when I started in this journey, I believe tithing is a principle. I, this is where I began, okay? Made it simple. Never stop there. God has been so faithful. But it's not about it. I'm just trying to tell you as a testimony to that end, okay? We as a church, listen to me, we as a church, I manage the church the same way I manage my home. We tithe our income here at the church. 10% of the income of Vertical Church we give to World Missions, Okay? And I check that all the time. In fact, I got a call from one of our missions partners, Pastor Patri- uh, 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 Dr. Patricia Bailey Jones, and she was in Haiti. She's got a work going on in Haiti. Now Haiti, in this last go around with Hurricane Matthew, got overlooked. She said, Pastor Ken, you have no idea of the devastation, but God's come through. There's a piece of land. We want to build a medical clinic there. I've got the, uh, it will take $5,000 to do. I said, Pat, I checked up on our things, called her back a day later. I said, Vertical Church will take care of that. So there is a medical clinic that will be happening in Haiti because of the faithfulness of God's people. I'm just trying to tell you guys, I don't ask you to do anything that I don't purposely live myself and run our church by. Now here, the fear would say, but Pastor Ken, we're going into community by design. Shouldn't we hold on to that? Come on, you can justify anything. I can say, well, yeah, we're doing all that for the kingdom of God. We're doing for that for the people of God. And yes, with 10% of the church's income, it can make a difference. But I trust God. God is bigger than that situation. I live by the principles of God, whether anybody signs on to that or not. So here, determine a percentage, number three. Allow it to be progressive. In other words, don't stay. Don't get comfortable. Let God continue. Faith should grow. And so should our trust in God. It should grow. And lastly, listen. Leave room to be prompted. Leave room to be prompted. See, the opportunity today to to sponsor an offering is one of those times. See, prompting means when you see something that goes beyond what you regularly do. And you allow the, the pull of God, compassion, to draw you to some place. You see somebody who's in need. Whether you know them or not, you see someone struggling in the grocery store and you pay their bill. Wait a minute. Are you kidding? See, 
Do you limit God? If, mer- if compassion draws you, guess what? Last time I checked, God is love. Wherever love draws you will never lead you astray. God is faithful. So leave room to be prompted. So listen, where do we land on all this today? We all have the opportunity today to begin to win the game by playing by the rules. Learn the law of harvest. Understand, God made the world to operate this way. You don't have to believe me. It's throughout everything. Everything in life happens that way. But determine a way that you can begin to trust God. Because at the end of the day, what matters to God is not what you have. It's what you believe about him. It's what you trust in him. Allow your faith in God to grow. Because that's the number one competition for the place that God wants to hold in our hearts. It's our stuff. But when we begin to trust God in those capacities, you build something that lasts for today, tomorrow, and listen. When the game is over and all the stuff goes back in the box, you can actually have the testimony before Almighty God that I'm rich towards God. Just simply because you did, listen to me, what God placed in your heart to do. Not what I say. If you think in any way, shape, or form any of this is because I want you to give to Vertical Church, well, here's the deal. Give it somewhere else. If, that, if you have that much issue in your, in your heart, or listen to me. Take God at his word. I've offered this to people over time. You take God at his word, you believe him, you put it to pass in three months. If God doesn't show up in your life and change your condition, I will give you 100% of what you gave back I trust God that much that God's bigger than it. So all the excuses, all the fears, all the rationales, all the reasonings behind it, just make a decision in your heart whether you believe God is able. Because the last time I checked, God is able to cause all grace to abound to you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, will abound to every good work. God's bigger than what you ever, whatever fear that holds you back, God's bigger than. But the only way to control fear is through faith in Almighty God. Bow your heads and let me pray for you today. Father in heaven, give us the strength and the courage today to face our fears. Give us the strength and the courage today, Lord, to learn the rules of the game so that we can truly be winners. That we can understand, Lord, that everything we have is a gift from you. And that when we're just simply willing to say, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you want, that will I do. I pray that, Lord, that your people would have the immense courage to just trust you. And learn how trustworthy you are. To learn how faithful you are. That they would finish their life with a bank that is so filled of faith. A trust in you that's unshakable because they have seen you come through again and again and again. Lord, you're more than enough. May that become crystal clear in every one of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we would trust you with everything we have and everything we are.